And now a review of Harry Potter House Cup Competition, a worker placement game set in the Wizarding World. Before we start, a big thank you to the op for sending us a review copy of this game. A Harry Potter House Cup Competition was designed by Nate Heiss and Cammie Mandel. Features artwork by Delaney Mamer. The Harry, this Harry Potter themed board game was published in 2020 by The Op, who are also known for a number of other Wizarding World themed games like Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. House Cup Competition plays two to four players, with the average game being about an hour and a half long, but stretching on the longer side of things. Now, in House Cup Competition, each player leads one of the four Hogwarts houses, sending their three students to various locations and classes to improve their skill level in three areas and collect magic and knowledge tokens. They then trade these in and use their class skill levels to complete challenges and earn points for their house. The house with the most points by the end of the semester wins the House Cup and the game. For a piece-by-piece -piece look at what you get in the box for this game, check out our Harry Potter House Cup Competition unboxing video on YouTube. Now, the only thing I think needs to be called out here is one highlight and one disappointment in regards to the components. So the highlight is the House Cup Hourglass display, which you build out of cardboard, and it holds four plastic test-type tube-like vials. Uh, they call them hourglasses, but they look like, like test tubes with a cork stopper. Now, with these, you get a bunch of these small plastic gems. Now, these aren't your usual aquarium gems. These look like little tiny gems in the four Hogwarts coat colors. Now, what this display is used for is to track your score during the game with players putting gems into the appropriate tubes. Now, not only does this just look cool, it's just a, one of the coolest looking scoring markers I've ever seen. I love the fact how you can quickly look at it and get a good idea of what everyone's score, score is without knowing exact numbers. So you don't get that whole, you're ahead by five points, so I need to do this to be, but, but you can kind of look and go, oh, this person's ahead, so I have to try to, to you know, get the leader. And I like that it's not exact, but gives you an idea. And I think anyone who follows board gamers on Twitter has probably seen pictures of this really fun component at least once on someone's timeline. Yeah, I, I'm really impressed by that that particular piece. Like, I want this to be used. Hey, designers, publishers, use this in other games. I don't, I don't know exactly what other games. Like, if you got a science game, you got beakers right there, throw it in there. But I really like this. Now, I did mention I do have one big disappointment, and that is the chronography used throughout the game, uh, on the game board and on the cards. Uh, for one, they are black and bland and no color whatsoever. And specifically, the one used for potions and the one used for defense of the dark arts are extremely similar. They are, they are roundish shapes. One's actually like a, a, a jar and the other's a shield. And the two look like they both widen out at the bottom. Like they're not just hard to tell apart across the table. I have messed up with cards I am holding in my primary hand. So I've messed up with cards in zone one going back to other podcast episodes where we talked about the zone play and like in regards to these two icons, like I really wish they were less similar or featured some color coding or something to differentiate them besides just a, a black amorphous blob shape that is similar to another black amorphous blob shape. Yeah. And in fact, D has mentioned that a Sharpie or a paint marker may come into play in order to make the game playable in the long term. Mm -hmm. And it is never good when that is a solution you need to take to your board game. But how is Harry Potter House Cup competition played? All right, so put the big board out on the table and everyone pick a house. Grab the stuff for the house, including the common room player board, um, the nine level trackers you're going to place on that board to show that all of your students are at level one in each of the three different classes. You're going to grab the tokens for your three students, your two basic lesson cards and two knowledge tokens to start. And then the second, third, and fourth players get some additional starting resources. Off the top of my head, I don't actually remember what the start player function is in this game, so Sean can't complain about it this episode. But I'm sure it's something to do with the person who most recently attended school or cast a spell or something. You, Schwazi, or whatever system you want to go first. Now, you're going to take the deck of basic lessons, shuffle them, place them on the board, and put three cards up into the market, and then do the same thing for the advanced lessons, the easy challenges, and the hard challenges. These are all Hobbit-sized cards. Room location cards, these are bigger cards of the appropriate level, are randomized and placed onto the four location spots on the board, and the level one location is placed face up. Now, the gameplay goes over seven rounds, split over two phases, in which players will complete lessons, 
send their three students out to locations on the main board, collect resources and level up in their skills in three different classes, and then hopefully complete challenges to earn points for their house. So there's quite a bit going on. Definitely not a quick filler game. No. Uh, it is definitely something to note, I think, especially in the Wizarding World games, because up until now, a lot of the games have been a little on the shorter uh, shorter side, more family friendly. Whereas when you get into that hour and a half, two hour game, you start losing some of the younger kids who just aren't interested in playing a yeah. game that goes on that long. Yeah, this is definitely the heaviest of the Harry Potter games that have been published thus far, especially from the op. So getting into the two phases of the game, and here's where you'll get to see just how complicated it can be, is phase one is classes. So the one thing you do during your classes phase is learn a lesson. You're going to take a lesson card from your hand and gain the benefit on the card. Now, each lesson has a class requirement and can only be played if you have a student with the appropriate class level. So I keep mentioning the classes. So every student is ranked in three different classes, charms, potions, and defense of the dark art. Now, lessons provide things like gaining levels in one of those three classes or gaining resources like magic or knowledge. Now, there are a small number of these that will also earn you house points, which are tracked by putting one scoring token into your scoring vial for every 10 points you earn. Note that lessons can be done at the start of your turn or at the end of your turn after you've placed a student, which I'll get to next. So hardcore Potterheads might be annoyed at the limited number of classes available, but you can't please everyone. Yeah, plus the fact that like I said we have said this is a hard, a heavier game, throwing in even one more class would exponentially increase the difficulty level of this game, both in learning it and being able to complete things. So they just stick to the three basics of charms, potions, and defense of the dark arts. So the other thing you are going to do during the class phase is place one of your students. You're going to take a student on to, from your board and place it on a worker placement spot on the main board and take the reward shown on the spot. Now, most spots on the board can only hold one student. Rewards include magic, knowledge, leveling up in one of the three classes, or the ability to take cards from one of the four markets I mentioned earlier. These cards include lessons, challenges, and other types. Sorry, lessons and challenges of two levels each. There's also a spot that gives you a small reward and lets you take the first player token for the next round. Now, most of these worker placement spots are permanent, and they're the same every game you play, the, the majority of them. The board's filled with them. Now, the location cards add a number of random worker placement spots that change every game. Now, at the start of the game, only one location is unlocked, but more become available as the game progresses into later rounds. Now, some locations are going to feature class requirements. You can't go there with a student unless they have the appropriate levels and the appropriate class. Locations may also have a knowledge cost where you'll have to spend knowledge tokens in order to use that spot. So we're really getting a strong Euro vibe from this game. Oh, yeah. uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you've listened to any of episodes of this show before. Yeah, this is definitely a Euro game. This is a worker placement game through and through. So phase two is challenges. So what's going to happen? Sorry, you are going to go in player order. So you're going to do one of these things. So you're going to learn a lesson, place a student. Then someone else is going to learn a lesson, place a student. And keep going around the table until you placed all three of your students. Then you get into phase two, which is challenges. Each turn, you're going to attempt to complete a maximum of two of the challenges, either two easy challenges or one easy challenge and one hard challenge. These are, again, represented by cards that you would have had to obtain by taking the right classes in the last phase. Each challenge lists one or more classes. Again, these are the charms, potions, or defense of the dark arts, and a level you need to have in them to get the reward. Now, these rewards, one of them is always a number of house points. So you're getting the, the victory points for the game. And they always include something else as well. That could be going up in levels, grabbing resources, um, or getting knowledge or magic. Now, to complete a challenge, what you're going to do is you're going to pick a set of your students. So one, two, or three of your students whose total levels combined, this is your students working together, in their classes meets or exceeds the class levels on the challenge card. Now, when completing challenges, you also have the option of spending magic. Magic is one of the resources you can earn by some lessons and replacement spots. Each magic token counts as one level in a class for completing the challenge. It's spent on only that challenge. Magic is not permanent. You're not gaining a level in potions. You count as having an additional level just for completing that challenge. 
You also must spend magic when you're advancing your students up to level five in a skill or higher. That's just a one-time requirement. When you get to level five in charms, you got to spend the magic. When you get to level five in potions, you got to spend the magic. Now, at the end of each round, you collect your students back. You're going to advance the round tracker one space. A new location comes up in rounds two, four, and six. You do this going around the table seven times, and then you do end game scoring. You get 10 points per gem in your house hourglass, 10 points per class skill you've managed to advance to level seven, and 10 points per pair of magic and knowledge tokens you have left at the end of the game. Player with the most points, their house wins the house cup. So the math on gems is kind of annoying because you get one for every 10 house points you earn and then multiply them by 10 to get your victory points. Um, although, and then everything is multiplied by 10 yeah. to get your victory points at the end. So why is anyone multiplying anything by 10 I, ever in this game? I think because they didn't want players to get one house point for doing something. Like it to make it because you don't never get 15, you never get 12. Everything's right. in multiples of 10. Right. So if you complete a difficult challenge, you might get 60 points. And I think it's to be able to do the 60 points for host Gryffindor. Whereas saying six points for host Gryffindor just doesn't sound as impressive. But then but the only then, reason I can think of. Okay, and well that makes sense to get to get you the 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 gems, but then why remultiply everything by 10 for victory points? Well, you're not multiplying it. Well, because you're going to count out your individual individual things and each one's worth 10. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I would just say, you know, you get how many gems, how many, uh, you know, yeah. how, how many of this, all, all you, of it, that. you can do it that way. Just drop the zero and yeah. add it on when I mean, your math's just, done. They just it's, seem to have added a, a level of math on there that is utterly unnecessary. Yeah. I, I, Deanna's pointed out in the chat room that in the books, it's always in multiples of tens too when they give out points. Right. So it's a thematic element, I guess. I, and it's it's really it's 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 one math or the other like doing the yes. math again and for victory points is really the kind of s silly point like what they should just do is tell you that every gem is worth 10 and yeah. leave it at that and not mention it in any other way yeah so as sean's pointed out every hobby gamer listening to this is like wow that's that's a, a worker placement game that's pretty much a basic pure not really any other mechanic combined in there. It's it's a worker placement game, and you'd be totally right. That's exactly what this is. Um, and I can't help but compare this game to Lords of Waterdeep because everyone out there in the world, in the big board game industry, seems to be convinced that Lords of Waterdeep is the ultimate gateway worker placement game. It's a pure worker placement game in the place to start. And I can't help but think that Harry Potter's Heart of War Battle does that as well but it's even simpler, even more pure. It doesn't have the investigation or the take that nature that you have in Lords of Waterdeep. This is an even simpler intro to worker placement games. And I think really for a lot of people, what this is going to come down to is theme. Are you a Potterhead or are you the fantasy lover? And that for a lot of people, I think will probably push them one way or the other. Yeah, I totally agree. So the entire game is sending your workers out to get resources to improve your skills so you can complete challenges. That's it. It's, it's a slow, steady growth engine building system where the more lessons you complete and the more classes you attend, the harder lessons you'll be able to complete and the more challenges you can accomplish, starting with the easy ones and hopefully moving up to the hard ones. Now, the trick to this game and playing it well is to do that as efficiently, efficiently as possible. And that's actually surprisingly harder than you would think. Like right from turn one of the game, you need to look at the challenges that are face up in the board and try to figure out a way to complete at least one, if not two in the first round. Then every round after that, it's going to be similar. You're trying to make sure you're completing the maximum number of challenges and trying to get those hard level challenges into play and completed as quickly as possible. And to do this, you're going to have to be very strategic with picking your lessons and leveling up your classes and very tactical with choosing worker placement spots to take each round. Overall, this leads to what is a very simple to teach game. Like I pretty much covered it all in my short description above that uses well-known mechanics in pure ways, but combines them in a way that leads to surprisingly deep gameplay. Like I was shocked by this the first time I played Harry Potter House Cup competition. Uh, if I remember, we did it on live stream for Extra Life, and I still continue to be impressed by the depth of this game. Like, oh yeah, this is heavier than I remember. 
Uh, and that's certainly a solid recommendation, I think, to most of our listeners uh, <laughs> of the hobby gaming uh, type. Yeah, so what we have here is a game that my youngest daughter can play that features a theme she loves, but which is deep enough to keep someone like me and Deanna even more so, who love heavier games, fully engaged while playing. Or some elements of the game I think could be improved. Uh, for one, just the overall look and aesthetic. Like for a Harry Potter game, I just want more Potter. I want more Wizarding World. Like I don't want a brave crab board filled with a bunch of brown rectangles filled with icons in it. And it doesn't help that there's the icon problem, right? That a couple of these icons are so similar, we continue to mess them up, as I mentioned before. Like the only actual artwork in the game that features anything Harry Potter besides the house symbols are the location cards, show locations from the books, and the, the tokens, your worker placement tokens are the characters in the book, but that's it. Like, this is a game filled, like a, a setting with a great visual history. It seems like a shame to me to not include some of that in the game. And while our imagery licenses can be problematic and often expensive for games to include, uh, and could conceivably push that game out of, uh, that price out of reach, the iconography just has no excuse. No, oh, I, I mean, that that oh, those two symbols. I gotta say, uh, my other disappointment here is again just how little that Harry Potter theme actually matters to this game. This has the same problem with Lords of Waterdeep as Sean has pointed out many times, and pretty much almost every worker placement game. To be honest, like I'm certain I could take this game and retheme it to any other license without any effect on the gameplay. I wouldn't have to change anything. I just have to rename everything and put out some new artwork. Like it does, it, it feels like I'm putting a token on a spot and collecting, I'm putting a worker on a spot and collecting two tokens. I It doesn't feel like I'm sending Harry Potter to Severus Snape's Defense of the Dark Arts class. Just, I, I don't get that from this. And the same goes with the challenges. I'm collecting points for having the right levels and skills and handing in some magic. I'm not assembling Dumbledore's army like it says I am on the card. Yeah, so one of the big problems with this style of game and why the theme ends up often feeling pasted on is the lack of structure fitting in with the canon. Um, the wrong people or groups can do things, which breaks the immersion. But if they couldn't, it would be a broken game. You can't have a game where the chosen one always wins, because mm -hmm. why would anyone ever play it? Yeah, that was something that came up every time I played with the kids, and they they usually found it hilarious that whatever they that, that this person did this thing that the that, that Slytherin put together uh, Dumbledore's army, or that Malfoy met someone, and there was I don't know I I don't know enough Harry Potter background, so I guess that is a good point about the game is you don't need to know Harry Potter to enjoy the game, but if you do know Harry Potter, you could find some things annoying. Another thing that it did impress me with this game is it plays extremely well at all three or three player counts. Surprisingly, at two, I usually a worker placement games don't work well at two, and it worked great. Now, I will say that with four players, it runs a bit longer than the box indicates. Uh, you're going to be pushing to the the two hour mark on this, especially in your early games. Um, Any time we played with four is definitely longer than I think it says an hour and a half on the box or ninety minutes. But you're definitely pushing longer than that. So is, is it that AP is becoming a concern when you get into that four player because I, of uh, location limits? I, to, to be honest, AP is a problem at all player counts. It's just the more players you have, the more AP you're going right. to have. This is an AP heavy game. This is to play it well. Uh, you could just put your people out wherever and level up whatever. But if you were, like I said, it's all about optimizing your turn. It's all about building that engine to get to the challenges as quickly as possible and like even Deanna and I have had some significant AP going and, and I'm trying to figure out how to combine your three students. So if I use these two students to complete this, do I have enough levels left to complete an easy? Like there's, there's a lot of things going on for a game with such simple mechanics. Right. And I think AP is going to be a problem, even as a two player game. It just, once you get up to four, you're just, you're breaking that wall of the, the, the time limit on the box. Right. I have honestly enjoyed every, game i played of harry potter host comp competition this is a solid game it is a great example of the worker placement mechanic being used in a pure way well the harry potter theme may not be as well integrated as i would have liked and there are some graphic choices that i think could definitely be improved on i do think host comp competition is worth checking out especially if you've got a harry potter fan in your family or game group but even if you don't this is an excellent gateway worker placement game this would be perfect for introducing new players to that genre of game. 
What shocked me the most about Harry Potter House com- competition is just how engaging it is for fans of heavier games like myself. While featuring gameplay family friendly level rules, winning the game takes a surprising level of strategy and tactics. Be sure also to check out Mo's written review of Harry Potter House Cup competition by heading over to the tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on reviews.